What if you had a full working system that helped you to create the reality you wanted in your life? Well, in this video, I'm going to give you my full, complete reality creation system that has produced unbelievable results in my life and for the people who I have given it to. And yes, like the title suggests, this has included exploding my income where I've been making over $10,000 a month consistently. In fact, it's been more than $10,000 a month. And also that's been with very little overhead, meaning almost all of it is profit. And I've been doing that with something that I absolutely love that lights me up and gets me so energized. In fact, you'll see there on screen that there was also a 20K plus month in there. And that was only for one revenue stream. It was actually more than 20K uh, because there are multiple streams of revenue that I have. Not only that, it has allowed me and my partner to travel wherever, whenever we want, and to live just an absolutely amazing and blessed life. We are actually planning to travel to Japan in the near future. It has also helped us to attract in our dream home that is by the mountains where we live. It even came with a koi pond, which is something years ago I secretly remember telling myself, oh, that would be so cool to have in my home. In fact, since I am mentioning my partner, parts of this system are also what helped to draw her in and so many of the amazing other things that have been happening in our life that I won't mention here, but I think you get the idea with the stuff I've already mentioned. Now, I'm not mentioning any of this to brag. I'm mentioning it to show you what's possible when you actually start to apply this system because this and more is available to you when you actually start using this. And so in this video, I'm going to be as comprehensive as I can so that by the end of it, you have a full system that you can go out there and apply and start getting results with. And so in this video, we're gonna be going over the rules to the game of reality creation that you need to know to make all of this work. It's so essential to know this. We're also going to go over the manifestation formula or masterclass and what you need to do in order to set this up so you can actually start manifesting in big ways, not just little ways, but in big ways. And by the way, I use the manifestation part of this in conjunction with everything else to more than triple my income in the last six months. So it works if you follow it. We're also going to cover what to do when things go quote unquote wrong. It's actually a crucial part of the game. One of the most crucial to navigate if you really want to create your reality. So we're going to go into depth on that too. We're also going to go over some best practices you can actually apply so that this stuff isn't just you know, something that you never use. We like to say it's shelf help instead of self help. And shelf help is like something you read or something you watch, and then it just goes on the shelf, so to speak, whether on a real shelf or in the recesses of your mind, and then collects dust. That's not what we want. We want this to be something that you put into action and actually get results with. So are you ready? You're gonna get out of this video what you actually put into it. If you watch this all the way through, stay engaged, take notes, and then apply what you learn, you will start getting results. But if you are distracted while watching, only half listening, don't complete it or don't apply it, you won't. And this video will give you more value, more actionable stuff and more results if applied than some people's full paid programs of hundreds of dollars, maybe even thousands of dollars. But again, like anything else, it will only start to influence your life if you use it. So let's jump into it. All right, so in this first section of the video, we're gonna be going over the rules to the game when it comes to reality creation. And this is so essential because if you don't know the rules to the game, it's very hard to play the game well. It's like if we're playing Tetris and we don't know the rules and we wonder why when it gets to the top, we lose or we're not doing so well. Or if we're in Mario, but we don't know how to control the character, why these turtles are coming at us, you know, or how to get to the next level. When you know the rules to the game, you can progress through through the game, you can upgrade, you can level up, you can allow for more things to come in because you're aware of how to work with the game or work with life to upgrade, to level up and everything else. So I'm gonna be showing you some clips from some of my previous videos I'm going to weave together that describe some of the rules to the game and why they're important to understand. In this, we're gonna be going over the predominant law of the universe, which is so important to understand kind of your side of the process, like what is within your control and also what is with 
um, without your control, as in what can you control and what you shouldn't control. And so we're going to go over some of these rules to the game that I think are essential to know and study so that you can use what we're going to go over after that, like the manifestation formula. Um, you're going to be able to use that stuff to actually produce results. Now, one other thing I'm going to mention here is this is a formula. This is a system. And just like a recipe, if you take some of the ingredients out or take some out and replace it with another one, it's not going to be the same thing. And so my invitation to you is to use this exactly as I present it to you, to absorb this information and to understand it, to look out for the things I tell you to look out for, to use the tools that I provide. So let's keep that in mind as we go through this video. Anyway, let's jump into it because we have a lot to cover. We're going to start with the predominant law of the universe called the law of balance. Simply put, this principle is called the law of balance and harmony. However, it is not probably what you're thinking when I say those words, when I say balance and harmony. Um, it's something that goes a little bit deeper than just what those words can really convey. You see, life is always trying to maintain balance and harmony, but again, maybe not in the ways that you think, because you might think, well, how can that be the case? How can it, especially with that word harmony, always be wanting to maintain? In harmony because I look out at the world and all these atrocities are happening that I'm looking at and this thing happened to me, etc, etc. And what it's really doing is maintaining balance and harmony on all three planes of existence. And it means balance and harmony between the spiritual, mental, and physical planes. And I'll explain what that means. And just if you are unaware as a human being, as a spiritual being in a human body, if you want to put it in that way, you have three planes of existence that you are operating on at all times. You have the physical one, which most people are down with. They understand, oh, I'm in a physical body. I'm in this physical world. And some people cut themselves off there. They're like, well, that's all I am. I'm just physical. There's only the physical world and my five senses, etc. Then there's the mental plane of existence. And some people, you know, a lot more people than what we're going to go over on the third plane of existence, but they'll buy into the mental one. Like, oh, I have thoughts. I can picture things in this thing I have called a mind. Okay, so there's a mental plane of existence where I have thoughts, I can envision things, etc. And we also have a spiritual plane of existence. This is what connects us to that which we actually are, um, to divinity, if you want to say it that way, or source, or the all. Essentially, this is also the energetic realm. This is the emotional realm, energy in motion. And as a human, you are operating from all three of these planes at the same time simultaneously. So you're not just moving in the physical plane and moving through time and space, but you are also doing things in the mental plane of existence through what you're thinking about and those projections you're sending out there. And as the Kabbalion and Hermetic Wisdom would say, everything is mental, the all is mind. And you also have a spiritual plane of existence, which is energetic vibration, frequency. And again, that connection to what we call source, or we can call it infinite intelligence, or we can call it the all. Some people call it God, whatever you want to call it. And the thing to understand is that all of these planes, they are not separate. They are not acting on their own away from each other. They're actually all in correspondence with each other. If you've ever heard the saying, as above, so below, and as below, so above, that's where this comes from. It's called the principle of cause and effect, and it happens on all three planes. And what that means is one thing happens on one plane, it will influence and affect the other planes of existence. They always line up eventually. They're in correspondence. And so keep that in mind as we go through what the law of balance is, how this operates in your life, that you are essentially a three-part being of mind, spirit, and body, mental, spiritual, and physical, and they all work together. They're all in correspondence. They are all connected. Now, to just give you a very simple example of how this works, let's say you think thoughts of negativity a lot. That's whether consciously and unconsciously, probably unconsciously, um, and then your conscious thoughts will most likely follow suit. But let's say you do what we call catastrophize, which means you think of the worst possible thing that could happen when you're focusing on something. Oh, I'm going to go do this. And what if I spill my coffee? And what if that person rejects me, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say you're doing that on the mental plane. Let's say because of that, because you're thinking that way on the spiritual plane, emotionally, you're feeling pretty terrible. You're not feeling great at all. And so the mental and emotional plane are in line.
line there. And what's going to happen is you're going to get the effect of those causes on the physical plane. You'll notice that someone who complains all the time or thinks negatively all the time very rarely has positive things, what we consider positive things, happen to them. Rarely has amazing opportunities coming in. Rarely has like uplifting people in their life, et cetera, et cetera. And some people go, well, that's, that's fairy tale thinking. This, this, thing, this stuff doesn't exist. It absolutely does. Because there are people, for example, who will do the exact opposite. They will think positively, genuinely, heartfeltly, if that's a word, most of the time. They will feel good most of the time. Doesn't mean they always do, but most of the time they've trained themselves to do that authentically and genuinely. And you see this kind of person who has all this abundance in their life and all this love. They have all these opportunities coming in. It seems like they got the Midas touch in a good way, not where they turn their loved ones into gold. But ultimately, like everything they touch turns to gold in a good way. They seem to be incredibly lucky. And there's a reason because what you're doing on the mental and spiritual planes will have correspondence in the physical and will influence what we call physical matter reality. And so balance and harmony doesn't mean positive or negative. You have to understand that the universe, God, source, whatever you want to call it, is neutral when it comes to this stuff. It doesn't operate from a moralistic uh, viewpoint. It just operates from a law of balance and harmony and will give you the like kind, whatever harmonizes whatever with whatever you're doing on those planes of existence. So you think negatively all the time, the thing that harmonizes that on the physical plane is like kind stuff. You feel kind of crappy all the time in lower level emotions. The harmony to that on the physical plane is the equivalent of that. It's things going wrong, a drop like living a drama based life. That's the balance to those things happening on those other two planes, you will get the balancing of that on the physical plane. You will get the harmonizing of that, the same key, the same tone on the physical plane. It doesn't mean harmony in the sense of like everything's so peaceful and everything. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what that means in this context. Unless, of course, you are thinking that way, feeling that way, and then it will harmonize in that way on your physical. But when we're saying balance and harmony, that's what we mean. Harmony, in this case, isn't necessarily positive. It just will match up and correspond to what you're doing on these other planes of existence. Another crucial component that pieces this together is something I say on the channel a lot, but the outer world, which represents your physical, follows the inner world. The spiritual and mental planes of existence represent the inner world. This is your thoughts. These are your visualizations, your imaginings, things that your imagination, which is such an, a powerful tool, your intention, you know, your attention where you put that on what you put that in your mind's eye, your emotions, energy in motion, what you're entertaining most of the time. The outer world is going to start following that. Now, a lot of people think this isn't the case because they think positively once or they have maybe even one day where for, uh, for the most of the day they were positive and things didn't change because the physical is a denser rate of vibration than energy or thoughts. Thoughts are instantaneous. I could tell you, think of a pink elephant and you will think it. I will say, think of whatever. Think of an orange that's um, red or an orange that's um, violet colored. You would be able to think of it in an instant. If I did something like, hey, I want you to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and then imagine a pet that you absolutely love. You can actually do this right now. If I said, close your eyes, and I want you to think of a time that just filled you with glee, did that change the way you feel? If you truly connected to it, absolutely. So also instantaneous, but it's not instantaneous with these things coming into the physical because it's a denser rate of vibration. It takes more time. So you can't just think a good thought once, feel a good feeling once. It's what do you think about and what do you feel most of the time? That is what's going to create a balance of either what we call positive or negative on the physical plane. A harmony of what, harmonizing with positive stuff or negative stuff. And again, I'm using these very general terms where we can insert many different things on that spectrum, but just to keep it simple, it will either harmonize and balance with the positive stuff that you've been maintaining in the inner world, or if it's negative stuff, it'll do the same. It doesn't care which. And when it comes to the law of balance, when you have a lot of power, you're empowered from the inner place. And also you gain more power the higher up the consciousness scale you go. We can show Hawking scale. So the higher up you are, the more literal energy you have at your disposal. This is a real thing. The lower you go down, the more dense the vibration. The higher you go up on here, the more um, 
lighter the vibration, more powerful the vibration, which means you have much more to work with, which means your creation abilities go way up. And it also means that you're then going to start balancing and harmonizing with this level of energy and that level of thought. Now you may think, well, why is that the case? Why is it that what I do on the inner world, you know, you may be the first time you're hearing this or even wondering what that is and we'll cover that, but why is it what happens in my inner world influences what happens in my outer world? Well, actually the biggest reason for this, and this is a scientifically proven fact, is that most of reality that you are aware of even is actually not physical matter reality. You see, physical matter reality accounts for about 0.00001% of what's actually out there, where the rest of it is empty space or energy, and that makes up 99.999999% of reality. That empty space energy is what we cultivate in the inner world, in the inner realm, the thing beyond the seen or the unseen world. This is our spiritual side of us. This is our mental side of us. And remember, you are in what we call infinite action, meaning you are always sending out a energetic signal, a frequency. There is no turning this off. And this is what true masters understand and what those in actually elite circles have been taught for generations, knowing that they are in what's called infinite action. You were always sending out that signal and they knew and still know the power in mastering your emotions because what's that do? It allows you to control the kind of signal that you're sending out. Now, what's important to understand about infinite action and where you are emotionally is where do you live versus where do you visit emotionally? Where you live is what you will end up getting more of. If you visit some other things every now and then, it's not a problem. But if you spend the most of your time in the positive emotions and act upon those, then you're gonna start getting events, opportunities, people, and so on that correspond with those more positive emotions. But again, it works the opposite way too. If most of the time you're living in a place of lower emotions, that's what you're gonna start receiving or probably have been receiving up until now. So because of this, emotions really is the whole game. So if you learn to master them, you will become a reality creation master. You will be able to focus on what you want to send out energetically and create what you want in your life as a result. So it's obviously important to improve and eventually master our emotional abilities. Those are some of the crucial laws of the game, the rules to the game of life. Now I want to give you some other evidence of this because you might think, well, this is just woo-woo thinking. Well, next I'm going to give you some kind of scientific backing very quickly um, to really confirm that this is not just woo-woo mysticism. This is something that's been blended from mysticism, the Eastern side of things. They've known about this stuff for thousands, you know, possibly longer of years, verse, uh, mixed together with the science that actually is starting to see that this is the case. So I'm going to play that clip for you really quick as well. Now, one of the founders of modern physics and quantum mechanics was Niels Bohr, and he actually received a Nobel Prize for his discoveries and research in 1922. And in his studies of subatomic events, which essentially just means events happening at a smaller level than the atomic level, he found that seemingly unrelated events actually contained an interconnectedness. So basically things we thought were random and things that we thought were not connected, he found at a deeper level are. So he and other physicists actually concluded that when an electron was not observed by a conscious observer, it actually remained an electron and didn't become a particle. But that when it was observed by a conscious observer, which you are, which I am, that we all are, it actually turned into a particle. And so the mere act of taking a conscious observer away or putting one in changed the results of what was going on. Now, I don't want to be confusing with the wording or the jargon here, so I'm going to keep it very, very basic. Essentially, when I say wave, we're talking about energy, we're talking about potential, and when we're talking about particle, we're talking more about something becoming more physical, more matter. You know, in more recent times, you can look at people like Dr. Joe Dispenza, who likes to say, are you being more wave or more particle? In his work, he tries to get you to be more wave, more potential, so that you can then allow more of the good things to come in, more healing, more things like that, whereas most people identify identify more with the physical world rather than the energetic or inner world. So when you think wave, think inner, kind of spiritual world, kind of energy. Particle is more 
physical. So that's all that means. Another experiment that really showed that this was the case, this whole idea of a conscious observer will change the interference pattern, will change if something is a wave or a particle, that we have a huge influence through our observation and other things in influencing reality, was the double slit experiment. And this experiment has been done over and over again, proving the same thing over and over again, that when you bring in a conscious observer, you collapse the wave function, you collapse the wave into a particle. When there is no conscious observer, it it remains potential. It remains a wave. And this is significant because these subatomic particles, um, these, I think they use photons in the double slit experiment, essentially these things build up what makes you and makes all of this physical reality around you. So if you can, at that level, change the results, change what's going on just via uh, observation, what can you do with the reality that's made up of those same subatomic particles. And essentially one thing this means is that those subatomic particles do not exist. They're waves, they're not that yet, until they are observed. They do not exist as a subatomic particle. They do not exist as a particle until they are observed by a conscious observer. And then it begs the question, how are you observing them? What intention are you putting in when you observe them? If you are the one collapsing the wave function, if you're the one collapsing the wave that's creating your reality, in what way are you collapsing that wave and into what kind of subatomic particles or how are you gathering those subatomic particles? Essentially, what are you building or attracting in your life through your observation? So it really begs the question, if that's the case, you know, how much influence can we have over reality? through using certain methods and techniques in order to you know, create the physical that we want through observing in very different ways. And this includes things like visualization. This includes other things we're going to get into. There are really no uncaused events in the universe as the law of cause and effect is always in play. And the way you look at things is absolutely a cause that produces certain effects. And so if at the subatomic level, we can use observation in order to shift what happens to take the potential and turn it into something concrete, can we more intentionally use this process again to create that which we want. And even um, in the words of Nick Herbert, he says, everything we touch turns to matter. And that includes what we touch via our sight. Our sight is actually a subtle form of touch. If you don't believe me, stare at an animal and like kind of send the energy uh, when you get a chance and you'll find that it absolutely feels your presence. Now, before we do move on to the next section, I do want to give you a quote from the book called The Awesome Science of Luck, which is by Peter Ragnar. And he says, numerous studies of very sensitive individuals have revealed that their bodies emit high levels of electromagnetic energy and infrared emissions. Dr. William Tiller of Stanford University states, the human body is not just a chemical and electrical machine, the human body is a light machine. And when you think of light, just remember light is energy. What is it that excites an atom? It is an emitted photon. If we are light machines, as Dr. Tiller suggests, then we possess the ability to alter matter and circumstance. Therefore, the more light you can emit, the more successful you will become. The smallest measurement of the energy contained in ultraviolet light is one electron volt. These are described as joules. Humans put out around 10 joules per second. As you and I increase the power of our intention and consciousness, we build a lens through which we can focus and concentrate our photons of ultraviolet light upon objects and events and influence their outcome. And this is in line with the double slit experiment and the how much effect we have as an observer of the works of all the quantum physicists like Niels Bohr, you know, we can look at Werner Heisenberg and there's so many others as well. Essentially, the more light that we emit, which is, again, we can do it in energy, light is energy. It's a very high rate of vibration. And if we look at things in a very particular way and we increase the light, which is higher levels of consciousness and everything else, the more we can influence reality. And to finish off this rules to the game section, we're gonna go over something called the reticular activation system and the part it plays in your ability to create. Because if you don't understand this, there will be a lot of things in your unconscious, your subconscious that trips you up as you try and start to create the beliefs you want that are actually gonna shape your reality. So I'm gonna go into depth what the RAS is, the reticular activating system, and how you can start to use it to your advantage 
in your life as you go about creating your reality. Now, what's very interesting about our beliefs is they really do paint our world and create our reality. And this is why, because you have what's called a reticular activation system. Now, a reticular activation system is essentially something that tries to reduce the workload of your conscious mind, because in your subconscious mind, you have all of the patterns, all of the beliefs. But if you were to try and consciously juggle all of that at the same time, you would go crazy. You wouldn't be able to do it. And so your reticular activation, uh, activation activation system is always on the prowl, always looking out to see what is deemed as important for you to put your attention on. And guess what? It is your beliefs that play a big part on what your reticular activation system believes is important or not. So for example, if you have a belief about money that, you know, money doesn't grow on trees and you never have enough of it, your reticular activation system will bring things into your attention throughout your day that reinforce that belief because it has been trained to see things that correspond with that because it's in the subconscious it's deemed as important. So it will continue to look out for more and more evidence that that is the case. Think of your reticular activation system as like a bouncer at a club and in the club is the things that get into your conscious attention. And so all of these things, like everything is coming towards the door for the bouncer and the bouncer, the RAS, the reticular activation system can only let in things that are deemed important or who on, or, or who are on the list of guests for the conscious mind. And so let's say you have a more negative outlook on life and a positive outlook starts to approach the club. The reticular activation system is going to look at the clipboard and go, nope, you're not on the list. I'm not putting you through to the conscious mind. But then some negative beliefs start coming through. The reticular activation system looks at the list and goes, oh wait, you are on the list. You're deemed as important. Go right on through. And so again, a bill comes through and the belief, you know, it triggers an emotion and the belief comes through of, I never have enough. I'm always don't have enough money or whatever else it is. Maybe something happens in a relationship and you have a belief that your relationships never work out or women are a certain way, men are a certain way. Bouncer goes, yep, that's in the subconscious. That's deemed as important. You're on the list you get to go through. And so this is what the reticular activation system is doing. If you've ever noticed when you, um, to give you a good example of also how this can work and how we can change this, if you've ever been excited about something, let's say it's been a new car. Let's say you wanted to get a new car and you were very excited about the prospect of getting that car and you believed you could get it like you weren't throwing in any doubt, but you were very excited about it. You may start realizing that you're seeing that car everywhere now and, and, in, and even in the color that you wanted to get it. Why is that? Because you kept thinking about that car you attached it to a feeling which was excitement. And so it became this, it became this belief. And then the RAS saw, okay, this is something that's important. This is in the subconscious. Now we want to continue showing them and making them aware when this car is about. So you start seeing it more in the past. That car was probably going past you almost as frequently, but you just didn't notice it. And so continually thinking about something while attaching that positive emotion to it, which in this case was excitement, helped create a certain belief that got the attention of the RAS to continue bringing that through, which allows for a conviction or, you know, a much more powerful, even more deep rooted belief to come through like a worldview will say. Essentially your reticular activation system is continually looking for evidence to confirm your current worldview. Now realize I didn't say continually looking for evidence about what is actually true. It is continually looking for evidence about what is true towards your current worldview, not truth with a capital T, but what is true based on your current worldview determined by your beliefs and your subconscious. That means if your worldview is one that sees and paints everything negatively, it will find the evidence to essentially confirm that truth. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're someone who is, has many positive beliefs and thinks about things in a very positive way, it's going to do the same for that as well. It's going to continually bring you the evidence of why you should be grateful or why you're abundant or why you're healthy in that same way. And so it can either be our best friend in that way or our worst enemy if it's more on the negative side, but we can also again deliberately start uprooting some of these beliefs that are causing this negative sway and start planting the beliefs that are going to get you to be more positive, which will end up bringing more of what you want into your life.
Now this obviously will act as a self-perpetuating feedback loop if we don't do something about it. You'll have a belief that life is a struggle, for example, because you were exposed to this idea repeatedly paired with a strong emotion. It was turned into a belief that your RAS then let in more of because it was deemed important, which provides more evidence of it being true. And now you have even more conviction that this is the case because your RAS reticular activating system is literally not allowing the evidence to the contrary into your attention. Remember, it's not letting it into the club, it's not letting it into the facility where your conscious mind is. Keep in mind that we never rise above the opinion of ourselves, which is why it is so crucial to restructure our beliefs and give ourselves beliefs and create beliefs for ourselves that are empowering, empowering instead of disempowering. Again, the RAS is not here to screw us over. It's actually an amazing tool. It is just working with what we give it. Our emotions actually act as a guiding system or a guidance system that allow us to know if we're on track moving closer towards our goals or if we're off track moving away from them. When you feel more positive emotions, this means you're actually more on track. It should be filling you up with joy and excitement and love and gratitude and peace when you are moving in the direction of aligned goals. However, when you're not moving in that direction, it feels like you're not being yourself. It feels like you're disconnected. You feel maybe fear, guilt, shame, all these different things, which is feedback that you're actually off course. Okay, so now that you have the rules to the game of reality creation, we need to get a little more practical because it's great to know the rules and it's good to have that because like I said, now you know how to play the game. So let's actually play the game. Let's make this practical so that you're actually starting to get results in your life. So in this next part, I'm going to share with you a full manifestation formula that is complete and will get you results if you follow it. If you follow this formula with the level of understanding that you've now gained in this first part, you will absolutely start to manifest. And if you add on what we're gonna go over afterwards, I mean, you're going to be getting so good at this so quickly. But I've left this full formula for you. This was taught to me by people, let's just say, who really know success, some of the most successful people. One of the most successful people that I know really showed this formula. It is complete. Again, really refrain from taking some of the ingredients out and adding what you think works because this isn't something we think works. We've seen it work and we know it to work. It'll work for you if you use it too. When it comes to manifestation, it is not about all these new ideas and this sounds cool and this philosophy sounds right. It's what is actually going to produce results for you and that's what I'm going to give you. You have to know, you have to know clearly what it is that your dream is. And what I mean by this, because there's a lot of people that say, hey, you want your dream life, you want this, you want that, you know, you need to have a dream, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, what you need to do is actually write out what is your dream scenario, your dream life, and it has to be something that you have no idea how to accomplish. And this is where a lot of people make a mistake. They don't do this part, and so they think it's something that they can do, or they think it's something small, or they think it's something that someone else wants them to do, or that would be a cool dream. You need to tune in and actually write out in a journal where you can see it every single day with passion with heart what it is you actually want and you have to get this right because if it's not something you actually want deep inside of you in your heart this isn't going to work because it's the excitement of this dream that is going to help us moving forward as we complete the rest of this puzzle and you can simply prompt yourself by asking what is it I truly want. And here's another thing, do not feel guilty or shame for whatever it is that you want. What is your dream? Is your dream to have your own business and be able to travel the world and that just fills you up with so much excitement? Is your dream to have a significant partner that's growth oriented, growth centric, and you two love each other and compliment each other and to start a beautiful family with them? Is your dream to be able to be in the best shape of your life, to be in the 1% of the 1% of people who are healthy, to maybe even compete in certain athletic 
athletic events or whatever else it is. It doesn't matter what the dream is so long as you identify what it is, you write it down, and you genuinely feel excitement when you think about it and when you look at it written down. Now again, I want to reiterate the point really quick before we move on to the next part that this has to be something that you have no clue how to achieve. Don't worry about that. In the next few puzzle pieces, we'll be getting more clear on that for sure. But it needs to be something you have no clue how to achieve. It's something that you're going to work with the universe, with God, with source, whatever you want to call it, in order to manifest. But it has to be something big. It has to be something exciting. You know, go into the dream world and really conjure up what is it that I actually want? What is the ideal scene? What is like the scene? Like think of it like a movie scene that you want to see yourself in, you know, in many, many years from now. And you're going to write that out in as much detail from the heart as you can. The first piece of the puzzle I gave you was having a dream, that this is so crucial, and it's crucial for a reason. It is that dream that is going to help determine the next couple of pieces. If we don't have that dream in place, we have no idea where we're going, we have no direction, we have nothing we're excited about, and we're just kind of aimlessly around, moving around uh, in life, not knowing where we want to go, thinking that something or someone's going to come in and give us direction, and here is the answer to that. There's no one coming to give you direction, or at least not in the way you want to go. There are plenty of people that will try and hook you to helping them in their agenda, but I'm assuming that's not what you want. One way to think about it, and I heard this from Earl Nightingale, uh, who came up with the greatest secret or the strangest secret in the world. He said, it's kind of like when you don't have a dream, you don't have a direction. It's kind of like having a ship without a crew or captain and just pushing it out to sea. Now, is that ship going to get to where they want it to go? Absolutely not. It'll probably just end up finding a storm or a deserted island and it will never get to where you want it to go. But when you put a crew and a captain on it and you set out to go to a specific destination, your chances of getting to that destination go up markedly. In fact, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to get to that destination. And so that's what we're doing in the last video and also in this. Because in this video, we're going to be going over what's called a definite chief aim. Now, this definite chief aim should be something that you know is going to move you closer to your dream, but this is where we introduce some more practicality so you're actually doing things here down on earth that move you closer to the dream and you're not always in the dream land. Now, what's going to happen is when you're in the dream land, it's going to start giving you ideas on what the definite chief aim should be. And I'm going to go over exactly how you can fashion this definite chief aim so that it's right and it actually moves you closer to your dream and you actually start manifesting. Now, just to give you some context, the person who coined this term, a DCA, um, was Napoleon Hill, who said he, this technique, when he used it, and he used it consistently, it scared him how quickly it began to work. And that's how powerful this can be. Now, a DCA means a definite chief aim. It doesn't mean you have three DCAs. It doesn't mean you have 10. And a lot of people, even if they do have their dream figured out, this is the next mistake they make because they don't have this puzzle piece. They try and do 10 different things at once. I want this. I want that. I'm going to aim for this. And that's like a ship trying to end up in four or five different destinations with one ship. Guess what? Not going to happen. Now, you could go to one and then the next and then the next. You know, a DCA, after you accomplish one, you just create another, whatever the best next DCA would be, to achieve your dream or get closer to your dream. But you have to have one DCA at a time. Now, why is it you want one DCA? Because when you focus your energy, which is massive when it comes to manifesting, on a singular aim, it's like a laser beam. When you focus your energy on multiple different things, it's like a light bulb. So yes, the light bulb illuminates the room, but it doesn't give it enough power to the thing you actually want. A laser beam isn't going to illuminate the whole room. Some things will be dark. You won't be able to see everything, but why do you care? If those things aren't that interesting to you, if those things you're not even really are the things you want. But if you focus on a, like a laser beam on the thing that you actually want, on the thing that moves you closer to your dream, you're going to get it that much more quickly. In fact, I'll give you another analogy. Let's say you have a watering can and every single day you only have enough water to water one seed, to nurture one seed. Well, if you plant 20 seeds and you try and water all of those plants with enough water to water one, what's going to happen? 
nothing's going to grow or maybe you'll get little manifestations here and there that aren't that significant, don't change your life. And that's why that happens. The focus is spread thin. But if you give that water every day to a single seed, to a single one you're trying to grow, eventually and very quickly, it will grow and start to bear the fruit that you want. And so what you're going to do in this video, for this video, the exercise is look at your dream and then ask yourself, what is something that if I were to achieve in the next six to 12 months would move me closer to my dream? That is your definite chief aim. Now here is a key thing you need to keep in mind. You always choose something you know that you can achieve. Again, the dream is the la-la land stuff. This is the thing that you have no clue how you're going to get there, even though we're kind of mapping it out here. You have no idea how that's going to come in. But your DCA needs to be something that you know you can do. Why is this? I know you've probably heard, oh, when you have a goal, it needs to be something you have no idea how to accomplish because if you, if you shoot for the stars, you'll land on the moon. If you fall short, it's fine. And that's not good advice, and I'll tell you why. The only time that's good advice is if your confidence and belief is sky high, and for most of you, 99.9% .9 of people, it's not. When you have a big DCA that you're not sure you can hit, you're going to introduce doubt into the process. And I will tell you the number one killer of manifestations is doubt. And so you choose a DCA you know that you can hit in six to 12 months, but is also exciting. And that's the magic. So choose something your head can buy into that won't throw any doubt in there because that will kill it dead. But also when your heart's exciting, like, hey, actually, yeah, that would be really cool. That's exciting because that moves me closer to my dream. Yeah, if I sat here with this amount, let's say it's a financial amount, that would be really good. That would be very exciting. I could do this. I could do X, Y, and Z. If I built my business to that level, that X, Y, and Z, whatever else it is, right? And so it has to be something that you're excited about. It has to be a single thing. It has to be able to be accomplished in six to 12 months and even better if you can achieve it before that time, because guess what happens when you achieve it before that time or when you achieve this DCA, you just make another one. And guess what happens when you have a win under your belt, your believability and confidence increases, which means then your next DCA will be even larger. And then your confidence when you hit that one will increase and so on and so forth. And when you have a bunch of wins under your belt, when you have a bunch of manifestations under your belt because you just focused long enough, your confidence is going to go sky high and your doubt is going to go you know, to rock bottom. And that's what we want to do. We want to build a string of wins, momentum here, that is going to allow you to continually manifest bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you try and go and like, I'm going to achieve this dream, I have no clue, and that's just what I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to focus on a DCA or these other parts of the puzzle. You're just going to wake up a week later and start getting anxious. You're going to wake up and go, oh, God, where is my, why isn't my dream moving forward? You're going to wake up and throw in doubt. You're going to wake up and wonder how it's going to happen. And when you wonder how it's going to happen, guess what that really is? That's doubt because you don't trust the universe. You don't trust source. You don't trust these unseen forces to do its job because you're asking how, which means you have doubt. The how is none of your business. So create a DCA that is both exciting, but you know you can do. As long as you do everything right, as long as you're consistent, you know you can do. And remember, we're doing this because it will focus it like a laser beam. But when you have some wins under your belt, when you have momentum, when you do this, the universe starts helping you to accomplish these things. Magic is going to happen. Video. This is another crucial puzzle piece in the manifestation foundations that will allow you to manifest big in your life. We're not talking small, tiny little things. When you have all of these pieces together, you're going to be manifesting in a way that changes your life and transforms you. And now we're going over what's called an objective. We're breaking this down even more. And this is very simple. The dream is created and that's something you have no idea how to accomplish. And then the DCA is something you know that you can to build up your habits, to build up your wins, to build up your momentum that is going to move you closer to your dream. However, six to 12 months is something that you is, is kind of far away. And so we want to focus even more closer to today. And so we're going to be going over basically how you can have an objective that helps you move closer to your DCA. So in the same way with your DCA, your objective should be something you absolutely know you can hit so long as you do everything consistently. Again, if you go out and you just stop doing all of this, you're not going to hit it. But 
it's something you know if you show up every day and you take the right action steps, you're absolutely going to hit this objective. And so your objective is something that's going to move you much closer to your DCA. And it's something that you know you can hit within one to three months. Again, the idea here, here is we want to choose something that's exciting, but also your mind can buy into. If there's any doubt, if there's any doubt at all, you should not select that thing. It has to be something you're confident as long as I show up every day and take the actions. I'll absolutely hit this objective. But it's also something exciting to where you're like, that's exciting because it gets me closer to my DCA, which gets me closer to my dream, et cetera, et cetera. So those two things in place, basically the heart and mind buying in, which is having the excitement, but also having the believability. Because and again, nothing will kill manifestations and growth and progress like doubt. There's no getting around it. If you have a bunch of doubt towards something, it's not about trying to remove doubt from that thing. You remove doubt by having some wins. So go and make it a little smaller, still make it exciting, but something you know that you can accomplish in one to three months. And again, ideally, and what's going to happen is you do take the daily action steps, you may find that you accomplish this before one to three months, which is going to raise your confidence even more. And then you create a new objective. So ultimately, create this objective to be something that moves you much closer to your DCA is a big step towards your DCA being accomplished. When you uh, accomplish this objective, it's simple. You make another objective. You look at everything again, you look at your dream and your DCA and go, what's the best next objective? And your confidence is going to be improved by that point as well. So you might even be able to go bigger, but it's always making sure that believability is there. And now the second part of this is you have to ask yourself the question, what do I need to do tomorrow that's going to move me closer to achieving my objective? And so every single day, you're going to have action steps and these action steps move you closer to your objective. You can ask yourself a very powerful question. I always ask this, self, uh, ask this to myself every single day and it's what is the best next thing I can do that moves me closer to my objective? And you see what's going to happen when you have all of these puzzle pieces in place is the universe is actually going to look at you, is going to see what you're doing and go, wow, Carla is actually serious about this. Mike is actually serious about this now. They are starting the manifestation process by writing these things down. You should be writing this in your journal. They're looking at it every single day. They're sending out that signal. Let's start giving them some instructions. Let's start giving them some guidance. And you're going to start noticing that you just seem to know what the action steps should be. Something pops in your head and like, oh, okay, that's an action step. That's, that sounds something, like I could, uh, something I can do towards this. Oh, and then this and then this. And then you're going to prioritize these action steps. What is an A priority and what is a B? And you can go C, D and all that, but just keep it simple. A and B, meaning what are the things that I should definitely do today? And what are the things that if I have time, I'll get to? right? Every single night or every single morning, although starting at night is usually better because you might forget by morning at night. It just kind of works better if you have it set up for the next day. You're going to write out what are the action steps I need to take tomorrow in order to move closer to my objective. And then all you need to do when you wake up the next day is make sure you prioritize these action steps and then you actually follow through with them. Now, action steps can be super simple, like literally what is the next action? Let's say, for example, with a YouTube channel like this, and I want to have a certain number of subscribers or I want to have, you know, whatever else, a certain number of videos, I would go, okay, action step is to come up with the idea for this video, come up with the ideas for these week's videos, right? And then it could be, okay, write out the scripts for each videos or the outline for each video, right? And I would do it maybe video at a time, right? Write out the script for this video. That's an action step. And then it would be, okay, I want to film the video. Right, So it's each action step and then you just kind of knock them off the list and then one by one you start building this which leads you closer to your objective and you're going to start noticing a certain level of momentum that starts to build. And the reason this is so powerful is because you now have a clear focus on everything. You have the dream that is really utilizing the non-physical really allowing the universe to see what the blueprint is. That helps you form the DCA because you know where you're going. So what DCA helps you get closer to that? Then you have an objective that helps you closer to your DCA and then you have the action steps that help you complete the objective which helps you closer to your DCA and when the DCA is complete, it's closer to your dream. This focuses you like a laser beam. You now suddenly know exactly what to do in order to get closer to that dream and to the point where that dream will manifest. And guess what? Each objective you complete 
It's a manifestation and you'll see what happens. There's going to be byproducts of you completing your objective. More than what your objective is will start to come in. Same with the DCA, but you have to trust this process. Now there is one final piece you're going to need. And this is essentially pouring gasoline on the fire. When you understand this, things come flying in. This is the part of the process that once you have this foundation in place that we've just gone over, once you do this next thing, this is when the results become scary fast. This is when things start coming in, flying in, in ways you can't even see. steps. And now this next part is another non-physical thing that you need to do in order to allow this to work powerfully. Because now you know where you're going, which is really powerful. That is you using your mind in order to move the steering wheel in the car of manifestation. So imagine that manifestation is like a car. You're in this car. And the first few videos we did got you excited. So that kind of like started the engine a little bit. You now pointed the steering wheel in a certain direction, like a laser, really focusing. So you're, you're moving in the right direction. You know your dream is down this road out of the infinite amount of roads you could visit right? You know it's down there. The only problem is, even though we started the engine, we have not pressed the, the gas pedal in order to start moving in that direction. Essentially, the main power behind the engine is going to come from what we are talking about today. And ultimately, if you have no power behind the engine, the car can be pointing in the right direction all you want but you're never going to get closer to your dreams. Now, we need to know what direction to go because let's say you activate the engine and some of you may have actually been doing this, but you have no direction. Well, you're just going to not only not move in the direction of your dreams and what you actually want, you might even move in the opposite direction. You might move somewhere completely different and then find yourself essentially having climbed the wrong mountain only to look from the top of that mountain at the mountain you really wanted to climb. And I got to go all the way back down. I got to drive back, right? And so here, is the key. The key after having all that foundation in place is you need to feel good most of the time. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you are negative a lot of the time, if you are in lower levels of energy, if you're in things like grief and shame and guilt and fear and anger and pride and things of these nature in apathy, in oh, just whatever, this kind of emotion, what you're doing is really making yourself more dense, more particle than wave, as some people would say. And this releases or reduces power. This causes your engine to shut off. And so even though you know where you want to go, you have no power behind it, which is going to send out the signal for that to come back. Essentially, the more power you have, the more you move in that direction, the more power you have, the more magnetic you become for these things to also start meeting you kind of as you're driving towards them. They don't become this static thing that just stands still. Remember, what you want also wants you. But by wanting it, you also have to feel good. You have to feel good now. Because if you treat your manifestation as something like this, that I will feel good when I have something, you won't get it. And if you do, you'll be miserable. You have to feel good now. You have to be at that point where you're like, you know what, I want this to come in, but it's totally okay if it doesn't. It'll be this or something better. And if you don't have that attitude about it, you become like this needy person that has to have this come in or else, you know, my life is ruined. It won't. Again, think of it from a romantic perspective. Have you ever had someone who's been like that? You know, I, I really want you. I need you. Has that been attractive or repellent? Well, for most people who are in a good place mentally or a good place emotionally, that's usually very repellent. And it's the same for your manifestations. Imagine your man manifestations are someone who absolutely is into you, but then if you become needy, they kind of start moving away. And so you need to do what's called lowering the importance. But when you feel good now, you start lowering this importance. Every single day, you should be reading out your dream with passion and excitement and really feeling the emotions as if it's already here. Read out your DCA with the same emotion and read out your objective and make sure you know what you have to do today on your action steps. But you need to feel it. If you feel it and it feels like something that isn't here and therefore I'm going to beat myself up over it, you push it 
away because it's not going to be something that comes in and fixes your life. It's something that comes in as a byproduct of feeling good. Now you started the engine and away you go. What I recommend you do is you write out a list of all the things you know allow you to feel good. And when I say feel good, I mean emotions like gratitude and joy, happiness and calm, you know, things of that nature. What allows you to be calm? That's a great emotion, peace and calm. What allows you to feel excitement? What allows you to feel happiness? You know, for example, do you have a pet that whenever you play with them, you're just giddy and you just love it, you're just all into it? That's an amazing thing to put on that list. Is it when you sing in the shower, you just feel so uplifted and, and you just feel so in the moment? That's something to have on the list. When you're out in nature, do you just feel so calm, like you just have no troubles, no worries? That's a great thing to have on the list. And then the trick is outside of your action steps, you want to be feeling good as much as you can. Now here's why. Because ultimately you are transmitting out however you're feeling. And for most people, they have what we can consider a negative ball of energy in their life because they're used to thinking negatively. You're feeding this ball, and for a lot of people, you have a really big ball. And that might sound, you know, kind of disconcerting. But don't worry, we can fix this. Now, the bigger the ball, the more magnetic the ball. Think of like a planet. The bigger the planet, the more it kind of draws into its gravitational pull. Well, think of your energy ball as the same kind of thing. It's like this massive energy that is pulling based on how much power it has. This is why we focus on like a laser beam on the kind of key foundations I've given you because we're going to switch this. Because if you start feeling good now, not only do you ignore this negative ball, which means you've cut off the energy. You've cut off the engine for the negativity that was growing in your life. Once you do that and focus on feeling good now, you start building this new positive energetic ball in your life. The bigger that ball becomes, the more magnetic it becomes, which brings more positive thoughts into your life, which brings more positive things into your life, and that gets bigger and bigger, and it starts to attract even more of that. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger as a result and starts to attract more and more of that. And the negative ball starts to decrease because you're not looking at it as much. You're not being negative. And there's a magical thing that happens when the positive energy ball becomes larger than the negative energy ball. You start habitually becoming positive. You start being able to feel good now almost without reason. And once you hit that state and you do the rest of what we've gone over, your dreams are going to start coming in. They're going to start flying in because you now have this massive engine of positive energy that is propelling you towards your dream, your DCA, towards your um, objective. This is when your believability goes so far up that your objectives at that time when you're at this point will be so much bigger than the objectives you started out um, with when you started this whole process because your believability has gone so far up. But those new big objectives you have at that time will be things you like, oh yeah, of course I can accomplish that in one to three months or my DCA in six to 12 months because you've built so much more momentum. You've built that positive energy that's become so magnetic that brings bigger things in even more quickly. And so this is why we need to feel great now. And if you skip this step, again, it's like you've pointed the steering wheel towards your dreams and your DCA and your objectives, but you never turn the engine on or you turned it on, but you're never pressing down on the gas because you can't or something's cutting off the gas and it won't move forward. This is how you move forward. This is the energy behind the vehicle. You have the vehicle. I've given you the puzzle pieces that are the vehicle and now we need the power. Now we need the energy and that comes through feeling great now, no matter what. Now I'm going to give you a little tip that was given to me by one of my mentors on how to make this work. You do want to try and feel great now no matter what. However, and this might sound like a contradiction, but I'll explain. You do not try and feel great now all the time. But no matter what, all the time. Yes, your aim is no matter what, but that's unrealistic. That's like saying, I'm going to go to the gym seven days a week, and if I miss one day, I'm going to feel guilty and fall off. The goal with feel great now isn't that you're in it all the time. You aim to be in it as much as you can. Whenever you remember, you go, oh, I'm not feeling so great. The most important thing now is to go feel great now. What the most important thing is, is recovery. When you fall off the horse to feel great now, how quickly can you get back on? What is the refresh time between you falling off and getting back on? Now, as you start this in the beginning, it'll be longer and longer times off the horse but it will become shorter and shorter the more you practice this. And each day, if you can just get back on the horse when you fall off quicker, 
and quicker and quicker. That energy ball starts to become bigger and bigger and bigger. That negative energy ball gets smaller and smaller because you're spending less time in that negative space, in that victim state, in that place of whatever you were in before. That positive ball gets bigger. You start remembering to get back on the horse more often. You start feeling great more often. And that's when things really start to roll. So when it comes to feel great now, when it comes to this crucial final puzzle piece, don't worry if you fall off the horse. That is not a call to beat yourself and be, oh, I suck at this, I'll never get this, ah, you know, whatever it is. It is just a call to be like, okay, I got hooked there, I got caught, my maybe a negative pattern that I'm working on and removing just got me, it just got me, it's fine. But now I can make the choice to get back up on the horse. And that's what you do. And if you keep doing that, again, you are giving power to the engine that is already pointing at your dreams if you do all the other stuff we mentioned um, with the pieces of the puzzle. And honestly, it's not that much to do, but it's consistently doing it to keep going. You do that, you have that steering wheel pointed, and vroom, away you go. Oh, you fell off the horse, you stopped, but you're still further along? What's happened? My engine's not going. I'm not, oh, oh, I'm off the horse. Boop, back on the horse, right? Feel great now. All right, so now that you know the rules and now you have that manifestation formula, that's fantastic. But something is going to happen as you start to apply this, and this is called the chaos. And we need to go over how to cover this or how what to do in the face of this, because if you don't, you will start taking steps backward as you're making these strides forward. You will you know, give up out of fear or get scared to continue to move forward towards what you actually want. So why is it that when we embark on this journey of expanding of our, our awarenesses and going to create reality, you know, really going on this path that people call self-development or call, you know, something where you're trying to manifest your dreams and you're doing these positive things, why is it that chaos comes up? I thought if I focused on positive things, like things attract like things. So why is there this chaos? What is the point of the storm coming up. Is there a point? Well, actually there is, because when you go on this journey of starting to deliberately create your reality, let's assume for the most part, for most of you, in the past you weren't doing that. So in the past, even though you weren't conscious of it, you were entertaining more negativity, certain thoughts, words, patterns, energies, and actions that led to you currently living the life you're currently living, because your physical circumstances are simply your energetic history. So now you've started to shift that, let's say, you are now entertaining new thoughts on a more positive end of the spectrum. You are entertaining new actions that are on that side of the spectrum too. You are speaking differently. You are feeling differently. Essentially, you are now giving off a completely different level, a completely different energy to the universe. You are expanding that outward. You are transmitting that outwards where in the past you were doing, let's say, the opposite. The new way in which you are living your life and you are moving resonates with different things on all planes of existence, including the physical. The so-called things in your life that you don't like came about because you were resonating with them for long enough, so they came about. But now you're changing that. And that means the physical has to change to start matching this new frequency or this new vibration that you're starting to send out. What does that mean? Certain things that represent an older vibration or an older story in your life have to start being cleared out to make room for the new. You can't have both. You can't have the low vibration stuff in your life and then have the newer, higher vibration stuff come in. The old stuff has to be cleared away to create the space for this new level to come in. This is why, for example, you'll see this happen a lot where someone is doing this. They're really focusing on their thoughts. They know that they become what they think about. They're shifting their energy. They're raising their consciousness. And let's say they're in a particular job that they don't enjoy. It's stifling them. It is preventing them from really expanding themselves, creating reality in the way that they want, etc. And let's say one of the things they want is financial abundance and independence. And then they actually lose the job. Now, most people panic, but when you really look at it, that job has to be removed in order to create the space for the thing that's going to allow you to have the financial freedom. And freedom being a key word there, because let's say in this old job, you felt anything but free. 
And so we label it as it's not working or only bad things are happening, but the universe life is just clearing things out to prepare you for the new, and it has to happen. And so this is actually a common thing that happens to people. Now this can happen in multiple areas, not just vocation. For example, relationships is another common one. When someone goes on this pathway, certain people start falling out of their lives. Even romantic relationships start falling off because the person in that relationship, the other person, isn't coming up with you as you're going through this process. And they're in a frequency of vibration that doesn't match where you are going, right? It, it can happen in friendships. It can happen even, you know, in families where there's not as much communication or connection anymore because you're in two completely different places. And it's not better or worse, right or wrong. It's just how this works that when you are moving to this new place, certain things that existed in the old place that don't match that vibration, that don't match that frequency, let's say they're down here, have to start falling off to make room for the new relationships, the new connections, the new job, the new way you relate to health or whatever else it is. Now what happens, especially in these two areas I find with relationships and the job, is people begin to panic. This is where they take that step forward and they start inviting life to come in and help them. Life is actually coming in and trying to help by removing certain things from your life that are heavy, that are energetic anchors, that are weighing you down from your potential and where you're trying to go, but then people panic and take that, take that step back into their old story, keep the relationships, the connections, keep the old job that they don't really like, but you know, they're not sure what's going to happen next, so they keep it. This is what usually happens. One step forward, one step back, and nothing is going to change until you fully embrace that new vibration, that new thing you're stepping into, that new reality you're trying to create for yourself. You have to be all in. If you just dip your toes and you keep going back and forth, you'll be given the illusion that you're making progress, but if we were to look at a graph of you going up and then down, up and down, it would just be a straight line across of what progress you've actually made. Now, this is actually not the only way in which chaos can come up when you go on this journey. It can also be feedback and challenges designed to help you grow on your path so that you are equipped with something you're going to need as you progress. For example, if you think of it from a school analogy, if you do not pass the tests on fifth grade, you're not going to graduate to the sixth grade, right? But when you pass those tests, you're now prepared for sixth grade and you can move on to that grade. It's the same in life. You can almost think of it like earth school. There are certain lessons you're going to go through and you're not moving into the next phase or the next evolution of your life until you pass those lessons. And those lessons don't need to take a long time. You can pass them quickly, but some people take 20 years to pass one lesson while one person can take a few months, another person can take a few months because they're actually listening to the feedback, they're actually embracing the discomfort of being outside their comfort zone, they're embracing and staying calm in the storm and then moving moving through that test, passing that test, having been equipped with emotional maturity and demonstrating that, or being equipped with the faith needed or whatever else it is. And so understand that life will test you to make sure you are ready for this thing you say you want. You know, a great example of this is people who win the lottery who then end up in more debt than they started out when they win the lottery. Why? Because they didn't pass all the tests needed for financial literacy to know how to make money work. And so even when presented with millions of dollars, end up losing it all because they never gained those awarenesses and valuable tools they needed that most people who get to that level of wealth actually do learn because they go through the process naturally instead of just being given something all at once right? And that's why we're not given things all at once. We need to go through these lessons, this feedback to gain the tools, awarenesses, insights, and things we need to help us and make sure we can operate at whatever that next level is. So what is the chaos? Ultimately understand it is not here to beat you up. It is here to serve you. It is here to present you with opportunities. It is here to present you with awarenesses and equip you with tools that are only going to help you along the journey. And so not to look at it in a negative light, but to look for the opportunity. When you are on this journey and you fall down and scrape your knee, instead of complaining or getting worked up about it, start digging for the gold because there's a message there, there is feedback, there is something that is going to help you along the way.
So what I would like to do now is give you what's called the movie script analogy that's really going to paint a picture of why the chaos starts to come up when we start to change. Now this is a clip from another video where I think I explained it very well so I'm going to put that in now in just a moment but this is so crucial to understand and I think will give you a lot of aha moments. I really recommend watching this part multiple times, writing notes, really getting this because it is such a key that can unlock so much for you when it comes to reality creation. So let me play that for you now. So I'm going to lead up to this wisdom by giving you an insanely powerful analogy that we actually give some of our high paying students and clients that is really going to paint a picture of how our reality works. So I want you to imagine that your life is like a movie. So you are living the life of your movie or your movie is your life. So you're living the movie of you, whatever your name is, that is your movie. I want you to imagine that like on a movie, you have a movie set, you have script writers, you have like the other actors in your movie. So you have like secondary characters. Now I want you to imagine that what you're seeing in your everyday life is literally just the script of your movie playing out. So I want to make an important distinction here when it comes to this metaphor, to this analogy. Um, so your life is this movie, right? And so you're playing out in the movie of you. But a lot of people think that they are the character on screen instead of the actor that is playing the character. So for example, one my mentor likes to make is Daniel Craig plays James Bond. So he plays James Bond. But is Daniel Craig James Bond? No, as soon as he leaves the movie set, he's Daniel Craig. He's just playing a character. And so to understand that in this movie of your life, you are simply playing a character that is adhering to a specific script that the script writers are making. There's a script, you are playing a character from that script, but you are the actor, you're kind of looking at the script and you're going on, you're, you're kind of in the scene of your life. So you wake up, you're in the scene of when you're waking up in the morning, you go brush your teeth, you go do whatever, you're in that scene and you're playing this character of whatever your name is. But behind the character, is the actor and this is kind of our true selves this is kind of our energetic selves this is kind of our higher self even if you will so just a distinction to make you are playing a character but you're really the actor in the same way that Daniel Craig is playing the character James Bond in the James Bond movies but he's not James Bond he's just playing that character in that specific movie and that's an increase in awareness when you realize that you're just playing a character. Most people get hooked into the character they're playing, forgetting that they're just playing a character and they are so much more. Now your movie looks a certain way because of what the script writers are writing for you in the movie, right? So again, Daniel Craig plays James Bond. He's just acting out whatever is written in the script. The things showing up on set are whatever the script writers are writing into the set, whatever they're writing into the story. Now here's where it gets interesting. When it comes to the movie of your life, you have certain script writers whose job is to write a certain genre for your movie. Now, how many people, for example, do you see who seem to be having a very dramatic, like drama, melodramatic type of life. It's always got this gossip and all these things are happening to them all the time and they're complaining all the time. Well, the reason is because they have script writers who are writing a melodramatic script, right? So by design on this movie set of their life, which is your physical world, by the way, so the movie set represents your physical life, it's gonna bring in people that fuel that drama. It's gonna bring in events that fuel that drama. And as long as you think you're the character and it's all happening to you, you're gonna get hooked into this and not know how to move on to a different set that has different script writers. And I promise I'm getting to the big part um, of piece in the puzzle in just a bit, but this might actually be a revelation for you, this idea I'm going over right now. So how do you start changing your reality so that you're not living based on this drama based script that these script writers are giving you. Now here's what most people do is they go up to the script writers and they start yelling at them. They start trying to take the pen out of their hand and write it themselves. But this is not the way to do it. As soon as you walk away, the script writer is just going to cross off whatever you wrote and put back in the drama script. Now why is this? It's because the script writer at the level you're currently at, it's their job to give you whatever script you're getting. But how do we change the script? Well, it's not about trying to influence the script writers wherever you are. What you have to understand, it's like having like a 10 story building and on each different level of that building are different script writers that are writing completely different scripts. Okay, so I hope you're with me so far. Each of those scripts lead to a different style of movie, a different genre. So on one floor, the lower levels, you have things like a guilt script, you know, a very kind of low conscious script. You have things like a drama, you have things like a 
horror movie, so it's fear-based at those lower levels. But as you go up the levels in this building with different script writers, you start having action and adventure. You start having comedies. You start having, you know, profound movies that move you emotionally. So the question is, how do we move up the building? Well, it's very simple. You hook yourself out of being the character and realize that you're actually the actor playing a character. And you see that you're on this movie uh, scene. You're in this movie scene on this set, and it seems to be drama-based. Now, the scriptwriters are there. You understand at this point that going up to them and asking them to change it is, is fruitless because that's their job. They're on the drama floor. They're produced and paid to write a literal drama. So they're not going to change that. They're not going to take input from you to completely change the script that you've agreed to play in even if you didn't know you agreed to do it. So what do we do? We walk up to the elevator and we press up. It really is that simple. And this is where this missing puzzle piece comes into play. So if you've ever felt in line with this analogy that you've actually done that, so things are kicking up in your outside world, you're in this drama thing and you're just like, you know what? I know that my inner world leads to my outer. I know this is fine. I'm just going to not hook into it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to raise my consciousness. I'm just going to raise my energy. I'm gonna be in a high vibration despite all that's happening. Now what you may have experienced is that means you stepped into the elevator because you're raising your consciousness and you're moving up to a new floor. And let's say this new floor is now like a more, you know, um, just kind of witty, kind of fun, kind of movie, like action oriented movie. So you've moved up. You're now on this floor because the drama was happening on the set in the other floor and you're just like, okay, that's happening. I'm not gonna resist it, but this is the drama floor. So if I don't want a drama, I need to choose a new uh, level in the building that just has different script writers. So you move up to the next level. And this is where this piece comes in because this happens to people, they move up that level. And if you ever noticed, like you kind of do that, but then you kind of seesaw between two levels. So maybe the drama script, and then you're like, oh my God, now my life is all flowy and action oriented and adventurous. Oh wait, now I'm back on the drama. Oh, I'm back here again. And you're kind of like going up and down. Well, this is why this happens because very few people understand what I'm about to give you right now. And this is called the law of continuity. What happens when people don't understand the law of continuity. So here we go. This is how the law of continuity works, right? So you move up floors and there you go. You're on this new floor of action, adventure and everything else. But here's the thing. If you expect that just because you're on this floor that snap like that, all of that's gonna form and now all the drama stuff's gonna be gone, it can't because of the law of continuity. You see what actually happens when you move up the floors is the script writers on the floor you're currently on, so you're on the drama floor, the drama floor script writers hand you a copy of the script and you take it up with you and you have to because of the law of continuity. And so you're essentially taking that script up with you, you hand it over to the new script writers whose job is to write action adventure comedy and they go, okay, so here's the script you've currently been working with. We need to write around this script. They can't just throw it out because it would break the law of continuity. It would ruin the game. It would ruin the movie. There would be, um, you know, like if you watch a movie and something that doesn't make sense suddenly happens, well, then it takes people out of the illusion. It takes, it kind of knocks you out of a movie and you remember, oh, I was watching a movie and you're not able to get hooked into it and actually buy into it. So if you go from like so much drama and then you snap your fingers and now suddenly you're a millionaire with a perfect relationship and all this different things, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work and the game would be broken, the movie would be broken, right? So there has to be the law of continuity. And what that means is, you are still gonna have a little bit of drama residue when you move up the floor from the script. But because these script writers write action adventure comedy, they're going to have to remove some of the things in your life that adhere to the drama comedy. So one way my mentor puts it, let's say in the drama comedy, because, or that's not, not drama comedy, but in the drama movie, you had a boss who was just such, like, he was awful. Like, just the worst boss on the planet, right? So, so micromanaging you every second, making you angry, like, just completely cold and kind of an a-hole, right? Now, why did you have that boss on the drama channel when you were playing the drama movie? Because you were on the drama floor. So the script writers wrote things in like that because you were on the drama level. It makes sense. You want drama in your life? Having a terrible boss is definitely going to provide that. You know, you want drama in your life? Having a terrible partner that's not right for you is going to be that, right? But now that you're on this action adventure comedy floor, the script writers have to start writing out the boss, but they can't just snap their fingers and pretend the boss doesn't exist, right? So you might have to lose that job or become fired. Or if you have a partner, you may need your partner to push your buttons finally to the point where you're like, this isn't right, and you break up with them or resolve it in some other way. 
And so through the law of continuity, they are going to have to write in some way that allows your script or allows your movie to start settling more on the actual adventure comedy. They're going to have to remove or change some of the drama-fueled things from the previous script so that it makes sense. This is why when you start doing the work, you might lose your job. And many people I've worked with, um, this has happened. I had someone in my EMF program, so it's a six-month transformation program that we run, and about two weeks into the EMF, she quit her job because again, she moved up floors very quickly and she knew to trust it, quit her job, and guess what happened? She got a new one in a week with higher pay that she loved so much more. Now, why did this happen? Because she moved up floors and instead of getting scared and going back down when the job, she was gonna lose the job and she was gonna quit the job, or she was, and there would be another way that it left her, she didn't quit. She would have been fired, something would have happened, or she would have had to gone back down floors, which means lower her consciousness, which is not really a good thing to do, right? If you're trying to grow. And so what happened is she knew to quit it because she was on this higher floor and we helped her through this. And then a new job showed up in a week because once that was written out of the script, it's like, oh, okay, bring her a much more uh, relevant job for the script that she's on right now, which is the action adventure comedy or whichever one it is. When you move up in the building to a higher level of consciousness, to a more fun, favorable movie, the script writers on that new floor inherit the script from the previous floor. Now, why is this so crucial to understand? It's because most people start doing the inner work, right? If you're on my channel, you may have experienced this. You're doing the meditations. You're doing the affirmations. You're feeling great now. All these things are happening. But I almost guarantee if not much is changing in your life, you're kind of going up the floor, stepping out of the elevator, and then something kicks up, the so-called chaos, and you're like, no, 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 and you go back down because you don't understand that through the law of continuity, the chaos has to be there. And your job is to embrace it, is to understand that if chaos is there, if you're doing the work in the way that um, we talk about, like you're really raising your consciousness and then there's chaos, that's just the natural process of change in life occurring. It's a good thing. It's moving things around. It's changing your movie set to adhere to the new script of the script writers on the floor you've moved up to. All right, so now you've learned about the movie script analogy. You've learned about the law of continuity, which is so crucial, which is why this chaos starts coming up. You've learned that the chaos is not there to beat you up. It is feedback. It is trying to give you something that will strengthen you along the path so you're ready for that next grade. But if you're not, you will stay on the grade that you're on. You'll stay on the floor that you're on if you keep going back down the elevator because you don't want to embrace the storm. But how do we actually do that? So now that the storm is here, you know why the storm is here, that's all well and good because then if you're in the storm, it's a lot different than talking about it. So what can we do to lower the impact of the storm on your emotions, to lower the impact of the storm so you don't get hooked in and instead you can embrace the storm so that you move on to that next level, you pass the tests and you're starting to create much more powerfully. So the first thing I want to mention is having more loyalty to the vision and trusting the process. You see, the chaos comes up and we go into solution mode and I got to do this to, you know, quell the fire. It's like a fire, you're putting out fires all day and I want you to relax and I want you to keep your mind's eye on the vision that you have for yourself. When you give more loyalty to the vision than the sense data, that is when you start winning the game of life. Because the sense data, everything you have in your physical, like I mentioned earlier, is simply an energetic history. The energy is what's happening right now. Everything in your life is simply an accumulation of energy you have entertained and, and put into action in the past because it takes longer for energy to coalesce, to be brought about, to be attracted into your life, to form whatever it is that you are currently experiencing. It is a history. So if you start arguing with the things on set at all of these things in your reality, you are literally trying to change things that are historic, that are history, that are the past. Instead of focusing on what it is you can focus on now, that's going to help create a new energetic history for you. And when you have more loyalty to the vision than you do in the current physical circumstances, you start to create a new future that will eventually become an energetic history that you actually want to live in. And so when the storm comes up, I want you to tune back into your vision. I want you to not get hooked in to whatever the drama is in the external world that's trying to hook you. You know, to not get hooked into it, to not get, you know, crazy about it, to get blown into the storm, but to remain calm no matter how much it's raining, no matter how much is being kicked up, because eventually that chaos will settle into a new level of coherence and order for you, which is the next grade. But if you get hooked in, 
You're just going to remain back in whatever grade you're currently in. Ultimately, when you lower the importance, solutions naturally start to present themselves and you can come through the storm. Now, one tool I'm going to give you which is magical and you can use it all the time is what we call amalgams. These are phrases or mantras you can say that kind of lessen the blow of whatever is going on. For example, a really good one is something positively amazing is unfolding for me now. When you understand that the chaos is actually not to screw you over and is actually here for your benefit and you just don't know what's happening or how it's happening, you can say something like that with full confidence knowing, oh wait, I know this is for my benefit. I know the universe is working for me. How many people say that, but how many people actually demonstrate that? There's so many people that go, I know the universe is working for me, but then when the chaos comes up, that suddenly goes out the window. What if you were to say that to yourself repeatedly and really believe it, really connect to it? You know what? I don't know why this is good, but I know it's for my benefit because the universe is always unfolding for me. These things are happening for me. I know this is so that something can be cleared out for me to learn something, for me to gain feedback, whatever else it is. And so something positively amazing is unfolding for me now. Some, you know, The universe is always working in my favor. You want to find a phrase or a few phrases you can use that you genuinely believe that will help you to to lessen the harshness of whatever is occurring that lets you lower the importance and not get hooked into it and think you know you got to run around and solve all this stuff right so have some of these phrases i just gave you some of my favorites um, you know another one of mine is i'm thrilled to just be a part of whatever it is regardless of the outcome so for example maybe some things have stalled in my business i'll say i'm thrilled that i get to do what it is that i do that i get to do something that i love regardless of what the outcome ends up being or regardless of of the outcomes and that helps me in moment where may, uh, moments where maybe there's more of an ebb than a flow happening in my business or maybe there's more of you know just uh, a quietness versus a harvest or a, a planting or kind of a nurturing phase versus a harvest I'll say that just to remind myself I love doing this don't get worked up about this and have more faith in the vision rather than what's appearing in the outside right now. So you want to have some of these phrases for yourself to really, again, shift the energy in these moments, and it's going to help you to embrace the storm. So in this final part, I want to give you some of the things that I really recommend you avoid. It will also show you to some of the things I recommend you do because I work with people at a high level, you know, through our program that's six months long of essentially reality creation, coaching calls every single week. So I get to work with these people, you know, at such a deep level. And I'm going to go over some of the most common pitfalls that we help them through and we kind of remove from them that for most of their life has been preventing them from creating the reality that they want. And so I'm going to give you what some of these are so you can start working on them now. And seriously, any one of these can become such a resistance that prevents the good from coming into your life. So let's go over what those are. Now, the first one I'm deliberately leaving until this last part of the video because I want you to see if you've been doing this throughout the video. And it's called the war cry of failure. And this is the war cry of failure. It's something one of my great mentors has taught to me. And it's the war cry of failure is... I already know that. I already know that. And you may have caught yourself doing that if you've made it this far in the video, going, I already know this one, I can skip this, I already know that, I already know that. And what you do when you do this is you cut yourself off from learning. You cut yourself off from being teachable and going deeper into the material. Because if you haven't noticed by now, a lot of the stuff we go over is repeated uh, information that you may have already heard once. But again, information and transformation are completely different things. The repetition of that information, the application and repetition of the application of that information is where you create these deep connections that allow it to take effect in your life. It's what allows you to experience things you would have never known about unless you did that, unless you went off and actually repeated over and over again, unless you had that open mind to go deeper and deeper into these subjects. Now that moves us on to the next pitfall, which is the pitfall of knowing knowing and not doing, which you may have gathered from the first one I went over. Knowing about something and knowing are two completely different things. Knowing about something and experiencing something, two completely different things. Information, transformation, completely different things. If you know something but you're not doing anything about it, you might as well not know. You're not going to get fit until you get on the treadmill. You could know everything about the treadmill. You know how it works. You've seen people do it. You could even know the mechanics of it, why it works. Well, of course I'll get fit if I do this and I eat this way. But guess what? That's not going to help you get fit unless you step 
on the treadmill and take the action. The next pitfall is not investing in yourself and sticking to only free content. We can call it YouTube University. Now you can get a lot out of sticking to free content, but there is a magic and energy when you actually invest truly in yourself in a very real way. And a lot of people resist this because, well, there's free information. So why wouldn't I just stick to that? Because there's a different energy to that versus investing in yourself. Now it's great to have the free information, especially when you're in a place when you're not doing well financially. And if it's literally you only have access to free information, you can definitely use that to get yourself into a slightly better financial situation. But from then, from there on out, invest what you can into getting to that next level. And then you'll have a little more to invest to get to that next level. And each time you're gaining something new to the point where you're going to be able to invest so much and not even blink an eye because it's just so second nature and you know the benefit it will give you. I know it's cliche, but the best investment you can make is always one in yourself. Again, when we take people through programs and they invest the amount they do, they get this empowered feeling, go through the program, and then they almost always say that it was worth more than what they paid. And now they have the benefit of everything we've done to take with them moving forward for the rest of their life, a foundation that they've already been building on to go even further with. There is a magic when you actually invest in yourself where you make yourself important enough to actually put resources into. And when you're not doing that, you know, you're communicating like a very different energy to the universe. And I'll even give you a story from my own life. This is something that I did, you know, in my, I think it was early twenties to like mid twenties, more early twenties. I didn't really, I had like a hundred dollars in my bank account, I think. And I didn't really have much to invest, but I invested little bits here and there where I could, whether it was just a book I could invest in. I used free material, but I remember there was one point I had, I think it was like three or $400 in my bank account. I invested in a coaching opportunity. Um, that was a hundred dollars a session and it scared me because that would have been a third or a fourth of literally what was in my bank account. But something in to to inside of me told me, do it, take the leap. I did that. And from there, a string of events occurred, an unfoldment occurred to where I'm standing in front of you right now, where that kind of investment is nothing for me now. It was at the time, but I invested what I could, which led me to more growth, which helped me to improve my finances, which helped me to invest more, which continued the cycle. The next pitfall, and this is another one that I'll just go over quickly because it's obvious, but victim mentality. This is what we call to me. Life happens to me. Um, nature doesn't reward victims and it might sound like very blunt and whatever else, but it's true. You know, if you blame everything outside of you for your situation, life will continue to give you more things in your life to blame about your situation and the cycle will repeat. It is a very disempowered position to be in or disempowered state to choose to be in um, versus an empowered state, which is when you can actually do all of this stuff. And again, if you want to hold on to whatever that is, you are free to do so. And it's not my place to tell anyone not to do this or whether their thing that they're, you know, complaining about is justified or not. That's not my place. All I am saying is I've never seen someone with a victim mentality ever move into living the life they've wanted to live. And so it's just something to mull over. If you're ready to start living the life you want to live, I would invite you to shed the victim story, your mentality, and to move into something more empowering. And next one is slowness of action. You would have heard me mention inspired action in the beginning of this video in one of the rules to the game and slowness of action or inaction is what holds so many people back. An inspired idea comes up and then they wait a week and then they wait two weeks. They wait three weeks, four weeks. By that time they've forgotten what it was. And even if they wrote it down, you may be like me. I used to do this in the past. I write it down and then six months later, look at that idea and went, oh, and I don't connect to it anymore because it was inspired in the moment. The universe loves speed. The universe is not giving you this inspiration because it wants you to wait a year until you actually take action. It is giving you that now in the present. It is giving you a connection of alignment to work with at this very moment. So you think about that thing and that idea and you're like, oh my God, I'm so excited about that. That excitement is meant to be the fuel to help you take the first step to actually manifesting and materializing that thing. And so don't fall into the trap of slowness of action. Oh, I need to think this through, you know, a hundred different ways and pro and cons and da, 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 da. You can do that if you want, maybe for a bigger decision, if you want to make sure your mind is bought in. But um, one of my mentors, one of the, one of the most powerful things he said to me um, before is that successful people take powerful or make powerful swift decisions all of the time. Unsuccessful people make powerful um, decisions slowly and usually not at all. 
Now, I've mentioned it briefly here, but if you are looking to work with me to have coaching on this journey to essentially help you get these results in the fastest way possible through our program, EMF, it's a reality creation program we do in live time. You get live coaching, you go through a group of other incredibly inspired people all moving in the same direction. And they, some of these people become friends for life, by the way. So if you want a positive peer group, no better place. But you can learn more about it in the first link in my description where I go over how it works. Um, I go over the results people are getting and so on. So if that's something that is interesting to you and something you could see yourself being a part of, please check out the first link in my description. Now, one thing I didn't actually mention in this video because it's slightly a more advanced concept, but if you want to go even deeper, is something called thought forms, egregores, and pendulums. And these are things that if you're unaware of and not removing from your life, can really stifle your abilities to create. They feed on negativity and other such things. And it's said that most average people, like the average person, has about three of what's called egregores on them at any given time and it would really benefit you to remove them if you have them. So go check out this video next where I go over what they are, what they're doing, what their purpose is, and how to remove them if you have them on you.